The first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Oh, the humanity! The fires of frustration and discord are burning. In Let us city. not forget for a moment the toils and efforts that lie ahead. They say that those who forget their history are condemned to repeat it. This is the History Lessons Podcast with certified financial planning practitioner Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor and your guide to financial wisdom in the past, present, and future. You ready? Good. Let's get historical. Yep. This is the History Lessons Podcast for the week of March 25th, 2024. And I'm Patrick Huey, author of History Lessons for the Modern Investor. If you're a modern investor seeking some historical perspective right now, once again, find yourself in the right place. This week, we'll be talking about March Madness, Lion Hearts, and election years. But first, the news. Well, with the NCAA basketball tournaments underway, for some, it's time to embrace the madness. But it was a quiet week for economic data, so you could tune in and watch your brackets get busted by the likes of Oakland and Yale. Luckily for you, my team was snubbed after going 24 and 12, so I had plenty of time to pay attention to the following. New single family home sales declined to 0.3% in February. Now, that might sound like a buzzer beater miss, but hey, they had two consecutive gains before that, so not too bad. As I've said before, maybe the worst of the full court press from interest rates is behind us. The recent drop in the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, courtesy of the anticipated Fed rate cuts in 2024, has sales activity on a fast break. Okay, maybe it's more of a slow break with a lot of stopping and starting. Existing home sales increased 9.5% in February. So existing home sales turned in a Cinderella-like performance, even beating the most optimistic forecasts out there. And it seems like after two years of sitting on the bench, the activity here is finally getting off the sidelines and back into the game. Finally, let's talk about the referees. No, not the ones causing controversy and consternation for Hoops fans, the ones who are refereeing the interest rate debate. The Fed met Wednesday and held rates steady. No surprise there, there was absolutely zero chance they were going to cut rates. Instead, they're eyeing the ball waiting for the right moment to make their cuts. Now it looks like a stronger than anticipated job market is going to extend their inflation game plan possibly into overtime, meaning higher rates for longer than expected. Interest rates are rising, and your annuity purchased in the last decade might not be keeping up, which means your financial plan may be falling behind. So if you own a deferred annuity, fixed, indexed, or variable worth more than $250,000, now is the time to review it and make sure it is doing all that it can for you and your financial plan. Let us help you keep your retirement on track. Introducing Victory Independent Planning. VIP turns complex financial matters into clear and confident solutions. So you can relax and enjoy retirement whenever it arrives. Get the annuity review kit now. This complimentary kit includes a variety of checklists, resources, and eBooks to review the fees, features, and flexibility, or lack thereof, in your current annuity contract. It will even help you assess your overall investment goals and the people who are offering you advice. Get the kit today, because you can't teach an old annuity new tricks. To learn how VIP can help you review your annuity, click on the link in the show notes or go to victoryindependentplanning.com. That's victoryindependentplanning.com. Sign up for peace of mind today. Alexa, charge the Wayback Machine and set it for 1199 AD. Charging Wayback Machine. On March the 25th, 1199, English King Richard I is wounded by a crossbow while fighting in France. Within two weeks, Richard the Lionheart was dead, and his brother John took over his throne. Now, Richard had become King of England in 1189 following the death of his father, Henry II. And his reign was marked by conflicts, particularly with his brothers, as they vied for power within the Angevin Empire. 
Richard gained his epithet, the lion heart, through his exploits in warfare. He participated in the Third Crusade, earning a reputation for valor and tactical acumen, although the crusade ultimately failed to recapture Jerusalem. Failing to recapture lands was apparently a family trait, because King John I renewed the war in France without success, losing holdings in Normandy, Maine, Anjou, and part of Poitou. He spent the better part of a decade invading the continent at an enormous cost to the realm. To finance his overseas misadventures, he raised taxes and ruthlessly, ruthlessly squeezed every penny he could from his barons, his nobles, and the church. Eventually, they rebelled, forcing him to sign the Articles of the Barons, later known as the Magna Carta, voluntarily limiting his royal powers, at least for a while. And you can read that full story in my book, History Lessons for the Modern Investor. But folks, these days, it doesn't take foreign military adventures or royal successions to boost spendings to levels that lead some to use their own creative epithets. Thanks to COVID relief programs and easy money policies totaling close to $12 trillion, what was already a massive debt, more than $23 trillion at the start of 2020, is now $34 trillion and rising. Interest costs on the national debt are projected to total around $66 trillion over the next 30 years, and they would become the largest program in the federal budget within that period, surpassing Medicare in 2046 and Social Security in 2049. Absent another Magna Carta, we should expect taxes to rise to meet these debt obligations. But a lot of people are ignoring this issue and just hoping it'll go away. And that's more like being the cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz than being lion-hearted. Your family trait should be to, be to prepare for the correct strategy and demonstrate the tactical acumen necessary for the battles yet to come. Way back machine disengaged. Returning to the year 2024. Finally this week, it's on to the mailbag. You've got mail. This week's question uh, of the week was, how should I be investing given that 2024 is ugh, an election year? Remember, if you are listening to this podcast and want to see the visuals referenced during this segment, please join us on Substack, where you can view the video version of this podcast, or on YouTube, where you can do the same. Now, you may have heard President Biden and former President Trump have both clinched the nominations for the Democratic and Republican parties, respectively. Now, that means that 2020 and 2024 are similar years in many, many ways. And you may have seen some memes about this on social media if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but they're both leap years. Uh, they both featured the same teams in the Super Bowl. Both had the same Super Bowl winner. Billy Ellish won Song of the Year in both years, and now we will likely have the same candidates for the presidential election. Can you say back to the future? Okay, key election dates. Uh, it's still primary season, which extends through June, even though both candidates have clinched. And it, that's going to be followed by party conventions during the summer. Now, each candidate is then officially nominated at these conventions, and usually the running mate is established, and the party talks about its platform. Uh, balloons drop and everybody hugs it out at, at the end. Now, campaign, campaigning will then continue throughout the summer, and it'll heat up next fall, potentially with presidential debates. And then it will culminate with the general election on Tuesday, November 5th. So the perpetual campaign season is ongoing, it continues, and it will go through November and perhaps beyond. Where are we currently? Well, let's talk about the Electoral College. There are 538 Electoral College votes available, and it requires 270 to win the presidency. In 2020, President Biden earned 306 votes, and former President Trump earned 232 votes the Republican candidate would need to pick up 38 votes this time around relative to 2020. In the Senate, uh, the Senate cur con uh, currently consists of 48 Democrats, 49 Republicans, and three independents that caucus or vote with the Democrats. And the Republicans need just two seats to control the Senate or just one 
uh, if they also win the House. In that House of Representatives, there are currently 220 Republicans, I'm sorry, 221 Republicans, 213 Democrats, and three vacant seats. Democrats would need to win five seats to take control of the House. So you can see it's very close uh, in both the Houses of Congress and probably a, a fairly close presidential election as well. Um, for better or for worse, uh, only a few states typically determine the presidency. In, in 2020, President Biden won 306 electoral college votes, uh, the same number that President Trump won in 2016. And although that appears to be a comfortable margin of 36 electoral votes, it's basically three states. Uh, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin would account for 37 votes. And uh, back then in 2020, it was a matter of 400, I'm sorry, 43,000. 43,000 individual votes turned all three of those states. So the potential to be a nail biter is there again. Several races were called days after the election, uh, and five races had less than a 2% spread of votes between candidates. Uh, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania all won by Biden, and North Carolina won by Trump. So close, uh, close contests in those states amongst the Electoral College would lead there to be a delay uh, in announcing a winner past election night. Uh, so those states, Georgia, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, along with Nevada, Michigan, and Florida, will likely determine the next president of the United States, as I said, for better, for worse. Um, Democrats are risking losing the, the Senate if they can't hold the toss-up states. Now, every two years, about one-third of the Senate is up for election as senators serve staggered six-year terms. And in 2024, there's 34 seats that are up for election. 23 are currently held by Democrats and 11 are held by Republicans. According to the, the Cook Political Report, there are three toss-up states, all currently held by Democrats. Uh, Arizona, uh, held by Kristen Sinema, who I believe has announced she's not going to run again. Um, and Ohio, held by Sherrod Brown. And then there's Montana, held by John Tester. Uh, Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia will not run again as well, so that seat is very likely to flip uh, potentially to the Republican Party. And there's just not much ground for Democrats to gain this time around in the cycle, uh, so they are at risk of losing their slim majority in the Senate. Battle for control of the House is going to be a tight one. Uh, all 435 seats in the House of Representatives are up for election every two years. And the Democrats would need to win just five seats to gain uh, to regain control there. So that's the landscape. What are the implications uh, for policy? Uh, well, let's take a look at fiscal policy. That's likely to be the key issue that people cite during this uh, election, especially when they're talking about why they're doing this or that with their investments. It, in the long run, it is or it should be policy not politics, that matters the most for the economy and markets. And both candidates have proposed various policies they'd like to enact. Again, it's early in this game, and, and we probably won't get much uh, in the way of details until the summer uh, when both parties uh, have their, their soirees uh, and announce what their platforms will be. Uh, but one item that must be decided on during the next administration is whether to extend or sunset a lot of the key provisions from the 2017 Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. That was the change in the federal tax code that lowered tax rates for a lot of Americans. It uh, redid essentially the entire tax code, including deductions and, uh, and tax brackets. And federal finances are, are already deeply unbalanced. Uh, we've talked about it here in this forum before, uh, but the 2024 federal deficit alone is estimated at $6.5 trillion uh, with $870 billion going to net interest payments. Now, you combine that with what is already a fairly large deficit at $34 trillion and counting, uh, we're looking at uh, some fairly daunting numbers, and I don't care what party 
uh, you are, those numbers should get your attention. Over the next decade, the budget deficit is set to remain, remain between 5 and 7% of GDP, which is historically high and is going to have to be financed at higher interest rates, possibly 3 to 5% going forward. So an increasing slice of the deficit will go to net interest payments, uh, which is unlikely to boost economic growth. Um, indeed, by the 2040s, the late 2040s, those interest payments could end up being the largest federal program in the budget, uh, surpassing Social Security and Medicare. Now, this is likely to send the U.S. debt to GDP ratio well above 100% over the next decade. We're looking at 120% by 2033. That's That means that our debt will be higher than our gross domestic product annually for the first time ever, including World War II. And this does not include the impact of a possible extension of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act past the end of 2025, which it is estimated would raise the deficit another $2.6 trillion. From a market perspective, this could drive bond yields higher. You may already be seeing some of that baked into higher bond yields. And regardless of the election outcome, neither party's likely to reduce the deficit from the trajectory it's on. And I would say neither party is super interested in extending those Tax Cuts and Jobs Act uh, tax rates either. Now, they may be saying they will. In fact, I've seen uh, you know, quotes from both sides of the aisle saying we'd like to extend those, those tax brackets past the end of 2025, but that's more than, than likely uh, early on uh, election pandering from both of those parties. It's just not fiscally feasible to continue on this level of debt uh, with our current tax rates. So other than, than fiscal, uh, let's look at what the Fed is doing uh, as far as its policy and what the policies could look like uh, in 2024 as an election year. Historically, the Fed does not sit on the sidelines during election years. Yes, it's supposed to be impartial, but history shows that they continue to pursue their dual mandate of price stability and maximum employment while maintaining its, and I'm going to air quote it, independence from politics. Since 1980, the Fed has either hiked or cut rates in every single election year except 2012, when rates were essentially at zero already, and the economy was still healing from the financial crisis. Now, otherwise, the Fed cut rates in five election years, and they hiked in five election years. I don't expect them to hike in 2024. But at some point, we will probably see uh, some cuts in, in rates as long as inflation um, is accommodative to that. And I wouldn't be surprised if those cuts came closer to Election Day versus farther away. Call me a cynic, uh, but that's just the way I see things. Okay, last up, investing in an election year. What can we do? Uh, to make sure that we are optimizing our investments in what could be a fairly volatile year. Well, political opinions are best expressed at the polls and not in a portfolio. Okay, this chart, this chart shows a survey from the Pew Research Center asking Americans how they feel about economic conditions. And the results show that Republicans often feel better about the economy under a Republican president, while similarly, Democrats often feel better about the economy under a Democratic president. Well, duh. I mean, this is an example of confirmation bias. You will look for information confirming your bias, and you will ignore what goes against it. And if your team is the Republicans, you're going to naturally feel better because you're finding information that confirms your bias that, hey, things are, are pretty good. If your team is the Democrats, you're going to do likewise. It's natural. It's part of the human brain. Um, so don't feel badly about it and don't hold it against other people. Just realize that it does happen. And this is 
completely uh, diametrically opposed to what actually happens, by the way. Average annual returns on the S&P 500 during the Obama administration were 16.3%. And during the Trump administration, they were 16%, almost identical. <coughs> and they were higher than the average return over the last 30 years of 10.4%. And yet, Republicans felt better under the Trump administration, and Democrats felt better under the Obama administration economically. So what we're trying to say here is don't let, allow your political opinions to cloud your investment judgment. Investors who allowed their political opinions to overrule their investing discipline, they may have missed out on above average returns during political administrations that they didn't like. Hating or loving the government is not an investment strategy. Investors considering waiting until their man or woman from their preferred political party occupies the White House should recognize how that would have worked out in the past. A $10,000 investment held in the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1896 to 2018 would now be worth over $6 million. bucks. But if you incorporated a strategy where you only own stocks whenever your party's in the White House and sell whenever the other party is in the White House, you'd be worth roughly $5 million less. But wouldn't we all be better off if the political parties were more cooperative and compromising and could get more accomplished? Come on, can't we just work across the aisle? Well, not necessarily. Historically, the markets have done very well when there has been divided government and quote unquote gridlock. Whereas when one party dominates both branches, the returns have been slightly lower. You've heard us say it before, but we'll say it again. Past performance indicates little about future results. Investors always wanna know how markets performed under different configurations of government or different years of a presidency. But these returns actually tell us very little about how markets are likely to perform in the future. Okay, we just looked at the numbers, but how do we know what's going to happen in 2024? We don't. In actuality, monetary policy, fiscal policy, economic growth, labor markets, corporate profits, and valuations are much better indications of future results. Okay, the economic contest, context, not just the political context tends to be much more relevant to understand historical market environments and returns. Returns tend to be lower and volatility tends to be higher during election years because of uncertainty. Markets hate uncertainty. And uncertainty, unfortunately, is at an all-time high uh, with this election as well as the last two. However, averages don't tell the full story as recent presidential elections have been particularly volatile with historic market drawdowns. If you remember 2000, there was a sell-off related to the bursting of the tech bubble. 2008 was the onset of the financial crisis and 2020 was COVID. 2020 experienced a sharp correction and a strong rebound, both completely unrelated to the election. Markets do not like uncertainty like we just said, and elections foment uncertainty. Typically in the lead up to an election, markets face headwinds because of that uncertainty. But usually once the winner is known, once things have clarified, regardless of the result, markets tend to move on and focus on the fundamentals. In almost every presidential election since 1980, markets moved higher after election day. A lot of people argue that the economy and markets perform better under one party or another, but over the long term, they both tend to fare pretty well under a variety of configurations of, of government. The most common configuration of government is divided, meaning not one party doesn't uh, control uh, both uh, the House, the Senate, uh, and the presidency. And that's produced 2.7% annualized real gross domestic product growth since World War II, and an 8.3% annualized return on the S&P 500. Not bad. And the odds are still highly in favor uh, of this particular outcome happening again. Odds are we'll see some type of divided government uh, after November. 
If you want more on investing in an election year, send me a message. I'll send you a digital copy of this report on election uncertainty. Don't let the election rattle your retirement outlook. It's complimentary. So just let me know where to send it. And it's all yours. Well, my fellow historians, that's it for this week. Be sure to check out my book, History Lessons for the Modern Investor. That's still available on Amazon.com. And be sure to do all the social stuff for us. Go ahead and like this episode. Follow us wherever you see or hear your podcasts. We're available on Substack, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or YouTube. Until next week, when we'll take another rollicking romp through the past and make an investment in your future with history lessons for the modern investor. See you next week. <laughs>